So uh, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for coming after lunch. I'll, uh, I'll do my best to keep you from falling asleep. So I'm Neil Krishnaswamy, and I work at the University of Cambridge. And uh, for the next four lectures, I'm going to talk to you about how to combine linearity and dependent types. Um, so in some sense, like uh, half the problems in programming languages can be solved with linear types and the other half can be solved with dependent types. So it's a very natural thing to put the two together. Um, but before, but before I put them two together, I would like to, um, I think I'd like to start by, uh, by working out how things work in the non-dependent case and then sort of show you what one of the things that linear types are for and then move on to dependent types at the end. So on Piazza, I've put up some initial notes about, uh, about what I'm going to talk about today. And um, it has like all the inference rules and things that I'll, I'll look at today. And it also has a, uh, a list of papers that sort of give the, give the outline of the, of the lectures I'm going to give. So um, it works out pretty nicely because uh, um, the first paper is from 1996, and it's uh, um, Phil Wadler and Nick Benton's paper, um, Linearity, Monads, and the Lambda Calculus. And uh, then several years later, the next paper we'll, we'll use is uh, Amal Ahmed, Matthew Fluitt, and Greg Morissette's L3, um, a linear language with locations. And then finally, we'll finish up with uh, uh, my paper with Pierre Product, Product from a few years ago called Integrating Linear and Dependent Types. And um, it's, it's in this order because the thing that Pierre and I built on were, were really these two papers uh, by Amal and company and uh, Nick Benton. So before, before I get into things, I want, to, uh, I want to sort of make a general point. So <coughs> often we start by... Uh, by saying, oh yes, we have the Curry-Howard isomorphism and like logics and programming languages are exactly the same thing. And that's not quite accurate. So like really the way to think about linear logic is that it's kind of a shell and you can, uh, and like this, no this intuition of linearity um, can be realized in many different ways. Like it's sort of a, uh, a good notation for many kinds of computational uh, intuitions. Like the, the one that will be dominant in this lecture is a sort of a notion of linearity as talking about ownership of resources. So we'll use it to control access to state. But you can also use linearity to talk about non-determinism. Um, you can also use it to actually talk about linear functions. So you can compile linearly typed programs to, to matrices and run them on a GPU if you want. Um, and there's, and um, there's so many different ways of thinking about linear logic because it's, it's one of these basic math, it's, it's sort of a notation for a basic mathematical structure. So um, in, when, we, when, we, when I start telling you what linear types are for, it's important to remember this is just one thing it could be for. Um, so when I, when I start, um, uh, let me see, how do I want to do this? So Frank Fennig last week talked to you a, a bit about substructural logic. And I'm going to, and this will be another example of how, uh, of how uh, linearity is a kind of polymorphic notion or a shape-changing notion, because I'm going to present things in a, in a style that'll be quite different from the way that Frank did. Um, so let me begin by, uh, by, on this side of the board, I'll write, the I'll write down the ordinary lambda calculus. So in the ordinary simply typed lambda calculus, um, you know, we have, we have some basic types. So we're going to, we're going to have some types, like we can have a unit type and we can have a, a type of pairs and we can also have a function space. And what we can do is we can say, well, now we can say what it means to be a term of this calculus. You can say something like, oh, I have expressions and these expressions can be units for the unit type they can be pairs for the product type along with, uh, along with projections, pi 1 of e, pi 2 of e. And we can, also have, um, uh, we can also have functions. We can have lambda x dot e, and we'll have applications. And finally, we'll have a variable reference mechanism in the language as well. 
Um, and so, th and when we when we have this uh, when we have this syntax, we can give a typing judgment to say which terms are well formed in, in more or less the following way. What we can do is we can say first, a context is just going to be a list of variables and their types. So we're going to say a context can be empty, or it can, you can have a context extended with the, with the information that the variable x has the type big X. And let's, let's just go ahead and write down some typing rules now. I'm, I'm reasonably confident that you all have, uh, have seen this already last week, so this should be mostly a review for you all. Um, and if I choose some kind of odd notation or there's something you don't understand, just go, just go ahead and feel free to interrupt. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, let's judge whether E has a type X in the, in the context gamma. And so this is going to be our judgment and it's going to have um, an introduction and elimination rule for each of the, uh, each of the term formers in the language. So in all contexts, we know that the unit has the, has the unit type. That's not one of our, one of the, one of the typing rules of the system. Um, another, another rule will be that if E has the type X and E prime has the type Y, then pairing will give us the, pair, the product type. So we can say that a pair E E prime has the type X, X cross Y when the first component has the type X and the second component has the type Y. Um, and similarly, if we have a pair, I'll write this as X1 times X2, then we can, we can project from this, uh, from this pair and we can say, well, if I take the ith component of this pair, then pi i of e will have the type x sub i. So I'm, I'm just being a little bit lazy here and writing one rule instead of two. So just imagine that i ranges over one and two. And now we can give the rules for forming functions as well. So we can say, I have uh, if, Oh, let me. We can say that a lambda term has the function type x zero y when, assuming that we have an x, we're able to show that the body has the type y. So this is the type for lambda abstraction, the typing rule for lambda abstractions, and we'll also have a rule for actually applying a function. So if we have a function of type x zero y and we have an argument of type x, then we can put the two together, e prime, to construct a term of the type y. And you can see that in, in all of these cases, we have uh, an introduction for the, uh, for the form and an elimination form. So again, here we have an introduction form and here is how we eliminate it. Um, and for units, we have, uh, we have our, our unit introduction and we have no, no elimination form for it. So if you, if you stare at the product elimination rule, you can convince yourself this makes sense because um, the product is a sort of binary, a binary tuple and it has two elimination rules and the unit is sort of a zero array product, so it has no elimination rules. Um, and there's one rule left here, and that's the variable rule. And this is, for our lecture, will be the most important rule of the lambda calculus. And what it says is that if we have a context and we learn that the variable x has the type x from the context, that's the type we can ascribe to this variable. So that's the lambda calculus, the linear, the, the, the simply typed lambda calculus. Um, and <coughs> uh, 
Yes. Uh, yes, I'm leaving out all the type annotations. You can put them in in order to make typing algorithmic, but that's not going to be that's not going to be uh, an important part of the of the of the uh, of the lectures. Um, basically, the reason I'm not going to do that is when we move to the dependently typed case, it actually turns into a pretty serious effort to prove that type checking is decidable, and I'm not going to get into that at all. So, okay, that, that, that looks really nice. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to about the linearly, the linearly typed version of this, uh, of this calculus. So um, in intuitionistic logic, we're allowed to use variables as often as we like. And um, in a substructural logic, there are restrictions on how we use variables. So let's see, let's see how we could do that. So on this side of the board, I'm going to say, I'm going to give a collection of linear types. Um, and we'll say we have a unit type, a unit linear type, um, a pairing construct, which, which, I, I, which is pronounced A tensor B. So the name comes from the, uh, from the tensor product in linear algebra. And we will also have a, a linear function space a lollipop, which is pronounced a lolly b. And it's pronounced lolly because this looks like a lollipop that's fallen on its side. <coughs> and just as before, we're going to, we're going to need to, we're going to need to say what the terms are, what the contexts are, and give a typing judgment for it. So as before, we're going to have a unit and we're going to have pairing. And now we're going to do something a little bit different. What we're going to do is we're going to give, um, we're going to give slightly different elimination forms for this. So what we'll do is we'll say, well, you could, you can have a projection from a, from a pair, but you can also pattern match on pairs. So let's do it this way. So we can say you can pattern match on a unit to eliminate it, and this is just like you might write in ML, um, let the unit pattern equal, equal a, a value of unit type. And we will also do our pairing, and just as before, we'll, we'll say, let's have a pattern matching eliminator for this. Actually. Let me change the names of the variables. I'll write little a and little b for variables on the linear side. And we'll also have a, a function space and an application. And this will look exactly like the uh, function space and application on the intuitionistic side. And just as before, we'll also need a variable rule. Uh, Okay, so, so uh, for the intuitionistic case, I wrote some syntax on the, uh, on the left-hand side and then put some typing rules in the middle. So let's do the same thing for the, for the linear calculus as well. So um, is this visible on the camera? Okay, so we'll also define what contexts are. These will be linear contexts now. And just as in the intuitionistic case, we're going to say it's going to be a list telling us what each variable's type is. And we will give another typing judgment, which says, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say that uh, um, P is a term of the linear type A. And now what this uh, we're, we're, we'll, give, we'll give rules. And because we're now in a substructural world, the, uh, the context manipulation is going to get, uh, is going to get more, more complicated and interesting. So <coughs> the, the, the first rule, let's begin with units is we're allowed to form the unit 
and it can only be formed in an empty context. And the idea is that uh, in, a, in a linearly typed setting, the typing judgment doesn't tell you which, which variables you're allowed to use. It tells you which variables you use exactly once. And this unit term doesn't have any free variables. So, um, so it can only be typed when there are no, no variables available for it to be used. And this, uh, this, this fact that the, that the context tells you what variables you must use once means that when we go into composite terms, we'll, we'll divide the context between the subterms when we're, uh, when we're doing a, uh, um, when we're writing down the typing rules. So let's, uh, this, this can be seen. in the typing rule for eliminating units. So what you can see here is that um, in the let unit pattern equals t and t prime, um, there are sort of two interesting subterms, t and t prime. And so that means that if we use the variables in delta to learn that t has the type unit, and we use the variables in delta prime to learn that t prime has the type c, then the whole thing will have, will use precisely the variables from delta and delta prime. Um, and, um, sorry, what was your, what was your name? You asked a question about non-deterministic typing. What? Matthias. So Matthias asked, oh, um, uh, in the, in the lambda calculus case, you left off the type annotation, um, does this, uh, does this affect the determinism of typing? And I said, yes, it does, but I don't care. And I'm going to care even less because in the linear case, um, what we're doing is we're saying the context can be divided into two subcontexts, delta and delta prime. And in uh, Frank, Frank's lectures on ordered logic, what this would mean is that the prefix of the context has to be delta and the suffix has to be delta prime. But in linear logic, you're, per, you're permitted to freely permute the, uh, permute the, uh, the, the hypotheses. And so what, when I write delta comma delta prime, what I really mean is that like some subset of the context has delta in it and some subset has delta prime. And if you put the two together, you get, you get, uh, you get delta. So there's a sort of silent uninterleaving interleaving of the context that I'm just not talking about. So you're, you're permitted to rearrange the hypotheses in the context silently. Um, so if, you're, if any of you are interested in this is actually implemented, um, talk to me after the lecture and I'll, I, can, uh, I can tell you about that. But for understanding what's going on, it's important to see, oh, some of the, some of the hypotheses uh, come from one half of the context and the other hypotheses come from the other half of the context. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, a list it can be it can be unordered. And now let's see if we can if we can work out what the typing rules for for pairs should be. So suppose that I want to say that a pair t comma t prime has the type a tensor b. So <coughs> can anyone suggest a typing for t? A, okay. So I, I heard someone suggest, what was your name? Jose. What? Jose. Jose suggested that T should have the type A. And what does that suggest about T prime? B, okay. Okay, so that, that, that clearly makes sense. But we're not, we're not done yet because the judgment says you have to give us some variables. So do you have any ideas about the, uh, what we should do with the variables here? Okay, so let me let me suggest again that when you have uh, when you have two subterms, you should be able to divide the context into two pieces. So does anyone now have a suggestion? Yeah. Yes. Well, any anyone can call out. That's fine. 
Okay, delta in delta prime. And what, what about the first component? Yes, that's right. You, yes, that's, that's a good point. So delta and delta prime just as up there, but it would also be equally fine to write delta prime and delta because we're taking the context to be unordered. Um, and I think in his last lecture, Frank should have been talking about the principle of exchange. And exchange basically is how uh, proof, theory not, proof, proof theorists say that the context is unordered. Okay, so we have, uh, we have our introduction rule for tensors. So tensor introduction and unit introduction. And unit elimination. So let's see if how we can eliminate a tensor. Okay, so I'm going to say if I can deconstruct T into two components A and B, then uh, a T prime should have the type C. So any, any suggestions for what the type of T should be? Who, uh, who said that? I heard someone say the right answer, but. Okay, what's your name? Jason. Jason, thank you. That's exactly right. So we're eliminating the T and we're getting an A tensor B, and that leaves C for the type of T prime. Okay, but just as before, let me make a little bit more room here. We're going to, we're going to, need, to, we're going to do, need to do some context management. Um, so anyone have, a, anyone have a suggestion for what we should write, about, write with the context? Yes. Okay. Is this what you mean? What? Just delta right here? Like that? Or am I? Yes, uh, and Okay. So delta. And then you're saying delta prime. Is, is, this your, is this your suggestion? No. No, you need, OK. No, no, you're, you're, you're on the right track. Do you have an idea? Ah, that's exactly right. OK. So sorry, what was your name? Charlie. Charlie. So Charlie said, well, we're binding two new variables, A and B, so we have to give them types. And since, since T is a pair of A and B, um, A should be the type of the first component and B should be the type of the second component. Okay, and that, that's actually exactly right. So, yes? Yes. So how do you guarantee that the binding A and B are exactly what you need to the uh, so, the, so, the, so the invariant of the system is that if, if, uh, delta, if, if T has the type A under delta, then every variable in, in delta is used precisely once. Um, and so here we're saying all, all of the variables delta, delta prime are going to be used exactly once. And so that means that the context has to be divided among the subderivations. And in addition, we're binding two new variables. So in this subtree, in T prime, we have to use A exactly once and B exactly once. And the way we enforce that is by putting it into the typing, into the typing context of the, of the uh, body of the pattern match. Does that, did that answer your question or? Uh, Okay, well, so, um, yes, yeah, so, so it'll, it'll show up when we do a lookup, and we haven't put down the rule for that yet. Um, so we're, we'll, we'll, we'll get there, 
And then it'll be the structure of the variable rule that'll enforce that. Yes? Uh, let, let's write down the rule for functions and then you, and variables, and then you can uh, we, we can come back to your question um, because it'll be easier to understand once we can actually uh, see the rules for it. it. It's a good question. We just need to pause for a minute. Okay, so in order to do that, we have to get, we have to get to the get to functions. So what we want to do is we want to say. that um, lambda a dot t has the function type a lolly b. And just as with pattern matching, we're, we're binding a variable in a lambda abstraction. And so that means that uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say that we need to extend the context with the variable that needs to be used once in the body. And you can see you can see that it looks an awful lot like the uh, the function rule for the intuitionistic calculus sort of directly above it. Um, and now uh, this should be well the introduction. Now what we can do is we can go to the uh, uh, we can go to the function case. So now suppose that we want to say that t t prime has the type b. Um, so what type should t have? Yes, uh, I don't know who said that, but someone I heard someone say a lolly b. So t should have the type a lolly b, and t prime should have the type a. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and uh, <coughs> now uh, now again we need to we need to divide our context appropriately. So does anyone have suggestions for how we should do that? Yes. It's the same thing as the product that we That's right. So we'll we'll say we'll say we have two subterms, so we'll divide the variable context into two parts. One for one for the function, which will have the type A lollipop B, and the other for the argument, which has the type A. And if T uses delta and T prime uses delta prime, you can put the two together to get the the variables used in the whole uh, the whole body, um, and now we get to the variable rule. And the way that we ensure that every variable is used exactly once is we restrict our variable rule compared to the variable rule for the intuitionistic case. So what we say is that the variable a has the type a when the context is a colon a. So what we're doing is we're saying, and we're saying that uh, um, we're allowed to use a variable when there's exactly one variable in the context. And that, that has, the, has the right type. And now the idea, let's see what we can do here. Uh, let me write one typing derivation. Uh, oh. Okay, so I'm going to have to hide these rules. Um, I apologize. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hide them. I know what I'll do. I'll write it on uh, on the on the projector, and we'll find out how good my uh, my typing skills are. And let's lower this. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw an ASCII art typing derivation. Um, and what this is going, what we're going to do is we're going to write a term that takes in. And so it's not going to be the world's most exciting program. It's just going to be a program that permutes a uh, that 
that, that permutes an, a, an uh, a tensor B into a B tensor A. And the way that this will work is uh, we'll get in a pair. Let me just write the program and B in B A. So you can, you can see that this, is, this, this program shouldn't surprise you because we're saying we get, a, we get a, a variable P of the type A tensor B, we match it to get an A and a B, so we do some pattern matching here. And then once we have the A and the B, we can construct a pair that's the other way around. And um, sort of the only interesting thing that's going to happen is um, we, can, we can write down sort of the, uh, the, the typing rules here. So we can say So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of writing a typing derivation from the bottom. What we can do is we can say if we have a, um, oh, sorry, let me pause one, just one second. Uh, David, is this visible on the, okay. I just wanted to make sure I didn't need to make it any bigger. Um, so what we're doing is we're saying we had the binder lambda p dot whatever for this function type. And now to type check the body, we assume we have a P of the right type, A tensor B, and now we want to type check the body. And you can see that going from the bottom to one line up, we've added one variable to the context. And now what we've got is we're, we're doing a, a pair elimination. So we're, we're eliminating the tensor here. And so this means we need to divide the context into two, part, two pieces. Um, and in this particular case, there's only one, uh, uh, there's, only, there's only one variable. So, uh, Four. So what we're going to do is we're, we, have to, we have to find a way of constructing a, uh, of checking that P has the type uh, uh, A tensor B if we assume that P has the type A tensor B. And then we have to check the body here, B colon B comma A, assuming that A has the type A, B has the type B, So now, now, now this is the, the rest of the tree that we have to build. And what we can see, and so, so looking at this typing rule, we're saying, oh, we had to divide the context into two pieces. And the two pieces that we divided this context into were the single variable context P and the empty context. And to the empty context, we added the assumption that A has the type A and B has the type B. So if you wanted to be like, uh, that, that's really what we've done. We're saying we have the empty context and then we're adding A to it and we're adding B to it. And you know, showing that P has the type A tensor B when we only have the hypothesis uh, that uh, P has the type A tensor B is easy. That's exactly what our variable rule says we're allowed to do. Um, and notice that we're satisfying the restriction that the context has only one variable in it. And now what we need to do is we need to use the, we have a pair here, and so we need to use the pair introduction rule. So, and to do this, now we have to divide the context again. Um, and let me, we need to show that B has the type of B. And we need to, we need to show somehow that A has the type A. And you know, how, how can we divide this context? Yes, that's right. 
So now, now we can use the we can use the variable rule again for each of these. Okay, I'm just, I'm not going to write the the hypothesis rule there on the side because I'll run out of space. Um, so you can see what's what's going on is that each time we we deconstruct a term, like the variable gets the variables get routed to one side or the other, and um, the interesting uh, so there's uh, so this this is sort of what enforces that every variable is used at, at most once because it can only appear along one path of a uh, of a branch. And the fact that uh, the hypothesis rule tells us that uh, um, the every variable must appear sort of guarantees that every variable does get used. Okay, so what, what, so did this answer your question, or do you have? Yes. Ah, okay. 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 Yes. So let me let me write down your question. So your question is, what if we had lambda a dot lambda a dot something? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, whatever that is. And so what what you're worried about is that this a gets the type. A, this A gets the type B, and maybe you can use it in an inconsistent way. Um, yes, that, um, that's what alpha, alpha renaming is for. Um, and so th this problem actually also occurs in the ordinary lambda calculus. Like, it doesn't have anything to do with linearity. Um, so the convention that's adopted is that, uh, this is called the Baron direct convention. What? We've been alighting renaming. So the, so the silent invariant in like all type systems papers ever is that uh, all the variable names in the context are distinct. And um, what alpha renaming means is that uh, when, you have, when you have a, a term, what? Yes. So we, we, we just assert by fiat that uh, um, that lambda x dot e is equal to lambda y dot y for x in e. And so this Berendrick convention says we want all of the variables in the context to have distinct names. And so um, we can avoid shadowing by just renaming before we, uh, before we push a binder into the context. Yes? Yes. Yeah, yes. So what we we'll, what we what we end up doing is we will say um, that this term right here. So th so what we're going to do here is this this can sort of be rewritten to to this. Um, and so the, the A in that context won't be visible. Um, and in the case of the linear lambda calculus, this may lead to some uh, non-typeability issues. So it'll, you'll get your type checker if you implement it, will complain that you're not using a variable. So in fact, let us see what my compiler does. And this is dangerous because, uh, let, it, let me see what I can do here. Okay, let me comment all this out. Okay. Um, you, can, you can safely ignore most of what I'm writing here. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shad shadow a variable and then this will, uh, this will make, the, make the compiler hopefully complain at me. Um, so we're what we're going to do is we're going to say let x equals unit in let Unit in in 
And then what can we just do? And let's see if I can actually compile this. Ah, yes. Oh, wait, no. Let me. There is, it's complaining about something. A diff, it's a different compiler. OK. <laughs> oh, no, it, it, was, it was the correct error. OK, so what, what happened in this compiler is it's saying, oh, there's, a, uh, there's an unused, var uh, it's saying unbound variable, but that's actually a typo. It's really, uh, there's a, a, a variable that's not getting used. So what we're doing here is we're binding x and then shadowing uh, to a unit, and then we're shadowing that x and then we're eliminating, we're eliminating, sorry, this one right here. And it definitely wouldn't like say like access, right? What? Like access. Uh, no, you can't do that. Um, so what, what's happening is that this X is going unused and we're getting a compiler. So, so if you're shadowing, you're basically guaranteed Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I think I think that would work. Um, it just sort of depends on what I did in my compiler. Uh, okay, so I think uh, it didn't like it. Um, I think it did some renaming and then that was missing. Yes. What? Yeah. Uh, so I take out the second let. Let's see what happens. Whoops. Okay, let's try that and see what happens. Okay, it's still complaining, uh, it's still giving this error. So not, maybe it's not the right uh, error. It, maybe it's not the error that I think it's giving. Um, so let me, so this part I'm type check, so at least it did last night. Okay, so now let's introduce an unused variable. and see what it does. Okay, and now it's complaining that this variable went. And let's see if it works or if we're going to discover a bug in my, uh, ah, okay, so there's an error in my compiler. <laughs> okay, so th th now, you, now you see the risk of running research code in a demo when you haven't pre-vetted the research code, okay. So anyway, what happens is uh, uh, what happen So basically, what happens is if you shadow a variable, there's no way for you to use it, and then you won't be able to type check it. Um, so be careful about that. Um, and uh, assuming you don't do that, then what you're going to end up doing is you're sort of dividing the variables among each subtree and the variable rule which says that you use exactly the variable that's in your context will enforce that every variable gets used. Yes? Okay, so can you please suggest that uh, this rule is that every variable is used at most once? No, exactly once. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, so if you, if, you, uh, if you say that a variable can be used at most once, that's called an affine type system. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's like, like, I think this is what Rust does. Yes, did you have a question? What is para? What? What is para? Para, what? P -A -R -A. Para, oh. Um, so that's, that's the HTML paragraph tag. So this, uh, this, this um, well, I'll show you in a minute. If you're, if you're really curious, what this is doing is uh, it's building a little HTML document and throwing it up on the screen. Um, so if you, P shell, oh, okay. So let's make it, and now test one dot HTML. So ah, there we go. So that's what it's doing. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll we might uh, depending on how much time we have, we might get into that later. Um, so, yes, so, so that's not what I want. Okay, so what's, what's sort, of, sort of what's going on here uh, is that um, in particular, 
the thing I want to emphasize is that right here we have the co uh, context with um, A colon A and B colon B in it. And what we're doing is we're sending B to, this, uh, to the left side and we're sending A to the right side. So this is the sense in which the order of the variables and the context doesn't matter. So the ordered logic you looked at with Frank, this program wouldn't type check because you're not using the variables in like the, the you know, sort of last in, first out order. Yes? Okay, so this means that you cannot write a constant function? Uh, you can write a constant function. Lambda x dot x is well typed. Uh, I mean const, so x, y. So ah, okay, yes. So. Uh, you can also not write a projection function. That's right. That's, the, that's right. Okay. okay, so let me, so we were able to write this and the, the two functions you were suggesting that you can't write in a linearly typed system. So, um, so you can't write a projection function which says A O times B, say A, this is the first projection. So if you wanted to write a first projection function, let, let's actually go through this. This is a good example. Um, of what's impossible to write in a linearly typed system. So if you wanted to write this in, in Haskell or ML, what you, what you might do is you might say, okay, well, I'm going to get in a pair and I'll pattern match it. And then I'll just return the first component. And what will happen is we'll run into a problem. Uh, so let me just copy some of this to go, go by a little bit more quickly. And now we'll have A, A, B, B. So now we're going to do. So now we want to write this and now we have a problem because we, have, we, we need to use the, the variable rule in order to assert that A has the type A, but we can't do that. So this is ill-typed because there's two, two hypotheses in this context and you can on, you're only permitted to have one. So what's going on is that this second component B is unused and um, a strict linear type discipline won't let you do that. Um, so another thing you cannot write is another, so, you know, let me put XXX here. Uh, another thing that you can't write, even more simply, is X dot. So you can't throw away a variable. So, th so this, this, uh, this ten, so this projection is, uh, can be, can be, can be shrunk down to like the, the unit, uh, to the, can be boiled down to this right here, where we're saying, I want to take any variable and just return unit. So this would be totally okay in ML or Haskell, um, or for that matter. But in a, in a linear type system, this is, uh, this is not okay because that X variable is not getting used. Um, and let's give you one more that you can't do. So the, the, another thing you cannot do is lambda X So now, now what will happen is, uh, yeah. actually let me write A. So now we'll say A. And now what we do is we run into the problem that we need to divide the context in order to in order to uh, in order to build this pair, and we only have one hypothesis that uh, um, that A has the type A. So we could give it to either the first component or the second component, but then the second, but then the other one wouldn't have the hypothesis. So we might be able to do oh A A, the first one has the type A, but then, and that's fine. But then what we would run into is the problem that in the empty context, we need to prove that A has the type A and we can't do that. So this is like 
Let me write this with the equals. So, so here the problem is that the yes. Um, no. Uh, so, so what? So why don't you suggest? Write. Tell me what to write down, and then. Uh, Ah, okay. So we have let a1 equals a. No, but in bracket, let a be. Let a. Not an a. Uh, a1. A1, a2. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so a. Uh huh. Uh, a1 equals a2. So. Yeah, in, in order for this to be well typed, um, A has to be a pair. <coughs> and at pair type, this is just the identity function. And if it's not a pair type, it's just ill typed. Yeah, so the, the inability to duplicate things, so the ability to duplicate things is uh, logicians for reasons I don't quite understand, they call it contraction. And so linear logic doesn't satisfy the contraction. Um, and the inability to, to drop things, oh, sorry, this should be. The inability to drop things um, is called weakening. So we don't have contraction or weakening. But the one thing we can do is we can reorder hypotheses. And so if you have A tensor B, you can, you can swap it around and build a B tensor A because we are specifically we are specifically licensed to be able to <coughs> reorder the context when we divide it. Okay, so is, uh, is, th is this, uh, is, does this make sense? Or is there still, is there some, something that's still fishy? Yes? I'm sorry for asking such a low level question. Uh -huh. But I think I can understand this too, understand mm -hmm. what you're saying. Ah, okay. Okay, well, let's, uh, uh, actually, while, while I'm here, I might as well. Okay, so let's zoom in here. Uh, bit width, kill this, and let me make it a bit bigger still. Okay. Okay, so. What we are doing is there's there's uh, there's a uh, that's that's really too small. So um, so what we're doing is let me let me maybe I'll try writing it in uh, in Haskell or ML. So uh, okay. So the the function that I wrote is something like uh, let x uh, f equal fun p goes to let a b equals p in b a. And let's run this. Uh, and so you can see, sorry, that what we're doing is we're saying here's a function definition and we, here's a lambda that's about, that takes an argument as p, and then we deconstruct it with pattern matching uh, into two subcomponents a and b, and then we put it together into a b comma a. And so you can see the type of it is it says um, if I have something of a times b, then I can build b times a. Um, so ba basically, what you are what you're getting confused by is my failure to indent the code. So, um, so sort of a, a better style would be something like that. <laughs> so does that does that is that more readable? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but I I was I just wrote it this way because I was just trying to type the tree as fast as I could. Uh, okay, any, any, any more questions? 
So low, le low level is good because the better you understand this, the less likely you are to, uh, to get confused later on. Okay, is, that, is, is everyone happy with this? Should I go on or should I, uh, okay. So now, okay, let's bring that up. So now the, now the question comes up, um, why would you ever want a linearly typed language to begin with? And you saw last week that one idea is, oh, you can use it to model uh, concurrent programs and you can use the substructural nature in order to ensure that, uh, you know, that every, every send is matched by a receive, only like, like protocols work out the way that they should. Um, another thing you can use it for is you can use it to say, um, to say that uh, um, if a variable is used only once uh, before it goes away, then an optimization that you can do when you compile a linear program is you can replace functional data structures with imperative ones. Um, and this will let you, this will let you uh, uh, ha have a language which has like a, um, a clean high level lambda calculus like semantics but which can be compiled to relatively efficient code. Um, and let me go back to that test. And that's actually exactly what's going on right here. So, oops, I went to, okay. Okay. So what's what's so um, if you've ever programmed like uh, a web app in JavaScript or something, you'll have had to you'll have had to build build your program by manipulating the HTML DOM. And if you've used it, you know that this is an incredibly imperative API. So in order to build a, build a HTML document programmatically, what you do is you you create an object representing the uh, HTML document, and then like you issue mutation commands to update it with all the changes that you wanna make to it. Um, so what you might do is you might create a box and then create some text and then update, the, update that box with that text and then add some more and then assign some properties to change the, to change the, uh, you know, the color or the font of your code, of your, uh, of your document. And then at the very end, you have, you have like sort of imperatively built up a document. And reasoning about these programs is quite challenging. Um, but what you can, but you know, this is, this is the API that the, uh, that the, that the uh, uh, gods of the W3C have given to us. And so we have to cope with it somehow. And, if you want, uh, if you want to present a functional API to this, uh, to this mutable, uh, to this, you know, this mutable underlying data structure, you can do so through like the medium of linear types. So what we're doing right here is this should, uh, this should uh, is we are creating some text. So on line one, we're creating a paragraph that says "Hello World," and then on line two, um, what we're doing is let me. See if I can, uh, and then on line two here, we're creating another line of text. And now we're creating a root, doc root document, which I'm calling W. And then I'm updating this, uh, this W by attaching line one to it. And then I'm attaching line two to this document. I'm setting its color to red, setting the font family, and then returning that document. Um, and this, this, you know, looks like this kind of state passing code that you might write in, uh, in Haskell or ML, but what it's, getting, what it's getting compiled down into is a bunch of update code. Um, so where you can see that the generated JavaScript looks, uh, right here, looks more or less like a one-for-one -one translation of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the code that we, we saw a little bit earlier. And let me actually show you 
how do I want to do this? Let me do this. OK. So for the moment, uh, let me give some colors here. So what we're, what we're doing, um, for the moment, ignore these Gs. I'll explain them in a moment. We, ha we have functions like color. And that says, if you give me a string, then I will take a DOM, I'll give you back a function which takes a DOM node and returns a new DOM node. And if you were writing, if you were writing this in ML or Haskell, what you'd do is you'd get a tree, update its color field with, uh, by building a new tree and return that new tree. But what we're going to do here, let's see what, here is where what we're doing is we're saying that if you give me a widget, let's focus on the, this bit right here, what I will do is I will in place update its style with the appropriate color and then return that same widget. And so this is the thing that has the type dom node, lolly dom node. And so we're taking, a, we're taking a data structure, performing an update on it and returning it. And this has a functional API, um, but it has an imperative implementation. Um, and this, uh, this allows you to, uh, to write programs which you can reason about and optimize as if they're functional programs, but you can compile and implement them using, uh, um, using, using imperative updates. And so this, this is sort of like the, one, of, one of the main motivations for, for using linear types in, uh, in programming. And now the question though is that we, all, we also saw, so, so hopefully seeing this assignment statement here makes you think, oh yeah, there's, there's like something like low level and awesome about linear types. Um, but at the same time, we've also seen that there are very basic things like duplicating a variable that linear types forbid you from doing. And so the question is like, okay, well, maybe I do want to implement a, a fast array processing algorithm in a functional style, but at the same time, you know, there's plenty of, of functional data structures that, that I don't want to use linearly. So is there any way to get these, uh, get, get these kinds of um, intuitionistic constructions and linear constructions to coexist with each other? And <laughs> there have been, uh, there's been a lot of work on this, dating back from the, from the very beginning of the work on linear logic. But about 20 years ago, is that right? 21 years ago now, um, Nick Benton and Phil Wadler had an idea. They said, well, <laughs> what we can do is we have a linear type system and it's great. And you know, we have the intuitionistic lambda calculus and that's great too. Um, so the best way of combining them is to not combine them. And so what they did was they said, let's just have a linear type system that's completely, that's a completely standard linear type system. And then let's add a completely into ordinary intuitionistic language. And then rather than trying to encode one in the other, what we'll do is we'll have both and then add some type operators to let you go from, from one world to the other. And so they said, well, <coughs> Idea one is they said, well, let's add a, let's add a type constructor, f of x. And what this is, is it's a, um, a linear value that carries, a, uh, that carries an intuitionistic value inside of it. So you can think of it as saying, well, if you have a value you're allowed to use as often as you like, you can use it one time. That's fine. Um, and conversely, um, the restriction on, uh, on linear things is that they have to use their values, uh, uh, use all their variables exactly once. And that's why you can't duplicate an arbitrary linear term. So they said, well, that means that um, if, if a linear term has to use all its, all its free variables exactly once, then a linear term that doesn't have any free variables is something we can use as often as we like. And so then in the intuitionistic side of the world, they added a new type constructor. They wrote down G of A. Um, and this, was, this you can think of as the type of linear, uh, linear gadgets that have no free variables. And then they uh, added, added some typing rule, some, some introduction and elimination rules for F and G. And you know, everything worked great. 
Um, and it worked out especially great because uh, it turned out that these that these two uh, that these two type operators uh, well, formed an adjunction with, with respect to each other, and that that gave them like a lot of really nice properties. Um, so let's let's put down some new some new introduction rules here. So G P. And I'll modify I'll modify the the intuitionistic calculus first. So, well, let me t let me tell you how the judgments are changed first, and then I'll give you the typing rules. So, what I've done right here is I've said that uh, I've left the typing judgment for intuitionistic terms alone. And that hasn't changed, but the shape of the typing judgment for linear terms has changed. Now, instead of having one, one context for its hypotheses, it has two. And it says, this linear term t has linear variables from delta and intuitionistic variables from gamma. And the sort of the programming intuition you can have for this is that um, because you're allowed to use uh, intuitionistic variables as often as you like, it's OK for them to occur inside of, uh, inside of linear terms. So we're saying, here's a linear term. It uses the variables in delta exactly once, and it may use the variables in gamma as often as it likes. And so most of these rules are just going to pass through gamma unchanged everywhere. So we're just piping things through here. And you can see that I, was, I tried to be careful to leave myself a little bit of, of space to write gamma semicolon. Um, and so we've updated the judgment form for, for, the, for linearly typed terms. And now we can give introduction and elimination rules for, yes? Uh, which one did I miss? Uh, Introduction of, of what? Right. Ah, yes, you're right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm pretty sure that the notes uh, the notes have this right. But if you any of you find any typos, send them to me and I'll fix them up. And now, uh, and now we can actually give introduction and elimination rules for these uh, for this uh, for this G and uh, for this G and this F. Um, and I told you that you can think of, uh, of elements of G of A as linear terms that don't have any free linear variables. And we can, we can turn that into that English description into a typing rule as follows. We can say in the context gamma, G of T has the type G of A. Just when... E has the type A, and it doesn't have any free variables in its linear context. And that's the, it's the, that's the whole introduction rule for G. And then there's going to be a little bit more that goes on right here. So we have a, we have a way of, of producing an intuitionistic term representing a... Uh, representing a closed linear computation, which means we should be able to turn a G into a linear computation. So what we'll do is we'll say, oh, if somehow I manage to cook up a G of A, then in the empty linear context, I can, you know, I can, I can evaluate it to get the A. I see Jason is squinting at this. Is it? Yes. Yes, the intuition for G is that an intuitionistic term is something that we can use as often as we like. And um, a linear term is one where all of its free variables have to be used exactly once. So that means that if you have a linear term, which doesn't have any free variables, 
then you can copy that as many times as you like because you're, you're using its, z free, its zero free variables exactly once, no matter how many times you copy it. Okay, so do you have a... So, uh, that runs the... Uh, yes. So it runs the cutoff that you're using in the string. Yes. So what we're doing is we're saying, oh, I have an intuitionistic computation which gives me a d of a. And because, because uh, all the intuitionistic terms live on the, uh, on the right side of the board over here and all of the uh, linear ones live on the left side of the board, we need to have some, some term to put one into the other. So what we're doing is we're saying, oh, I have a G of A and running it will give me an A. And because notionally this is a, this is a closed linear term, it doesn't have, it doesn't use any, any linear resources to, to execute it. And now we'll, we need to have some, some rules for F. And just as with the G, we, we had a way of embedding a, uh, uh, a linear term into an intuitionistic, into the intuitionistic calculus, we'll do the same thing. We'll say f of e is an introduction is an introduction form for the uh, uh, for the for the f of x linear type constructor. It'll say, okay, if e has the type x intuitionistically, then you don't need any linear resources to produce an f of x. And now we need an elimination form for f. And this is a little bit subtle because what we would really like to do is we'd like to know that once we have an f of x, we'd like to be able to use it several times. Um, and the, the, the issue is that when you get a term of type f of x, maybe you did use some linear variables to produce it. So we use some linear resources to produce an intuitionistic value. How can we use that resulting intuitionistic value several times? And the answer is we can turn to our old friend pattern matching again. And what we will do is here, we'll say that if we can produce a linear term of type f of x, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we needed some linear, linear resources to produce f of x, and t prime will need some linear resources of its own, which we'll put into delta prime, and what we can do is we can say, but once we've got this, this intuitionistic value of type x, we can use that as often as we like. And we can do that by saying p prime can refer to, this in, to an intuitionistic variable, which is what we'll bind the result of f of x to. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, if you give me an f of x, then um, you, can, you can bind the f of x to a variable, to an intuitionistic variable x, and then use it to, uh, to uh, as often as you like in your construction of t prime. So to, to make that point a little bit clearer, let me write one derivation, and then I think I will run out of time for today. So what we'll do is we'll show how f of x can be used to can be used to produce two f of x's. So in general, this isn't this isn't okay for a linearly typed term. You can't send a. We we learned that it's not possible to send an a to a tensor a. But in the specific case of uh, of f of x, we will be able to duplicate it, and so. Lambda A Okay. And 
what we're going to do. So, you know, as, as, as before, we started with this lambda. <laughs> what? Oh, is the projector off? OK. OK. OK, there we go. So what we're going to do is down at the bottom, we're starting in an empty con whoops. We're starting in an empty context. There's no intuitionistic <coughs> variables and no linear variables. And then the lambda rule says, okay, you can add this linear variable A, which has the type f of x. And then Now, now that we have this, uh, uh, now that we have this, we can use the variable rule to conclude that uh, a has the type f of x. And now, um, we're, we're using the f elimination rule, and we know that x has the type x. And we want to show that f of x, s comma f of x has the type uh, um, f of x tensor f of x. And let me only write one of these because the, t the two sides of the pair are identical. So here, what we need to do is we need to show that as the type in the context. And to show this, what we need to do is we can use the F introduction rule. And now we need to show that x colon x, which you know you get from the intuitionistic variable rule, and then for the other for the other component, we're going to have uh, a, a derivation exactly like this. Yes. So, so do we now have so we have a we have a constant function in the intuitionistic segment. We don't have one in the pure linear segment. Is yeah. There, is there now with this big F and big G some sort of mixed constant function we can have? Uh, yes. So what you can do is, so here you can write f of x can be duplicated. And similarly, you can write, you can give a term that says uh, if f contains a, uh, um, an intuitionistic thing, you can, you can drop it as well. So like this kind of contraction and weakening become admissible for, uh, for these intuitionistic types. Um, so um, did, did Frank sh talk to you about exponentials last week? Like this bang type? No, okay. So we, we now uh, mix <coughs> these two languages together, but do we still have two languages or do we have one? Uh, we now have one language, but we have like, uh, we have sort of like two subsystems that are connected to each other. Um, so if, you, if you've done, uh, programming in like uh, Haskell or something, you, you're sort of used to the phenomena that you have a sort of uh, um, pure, pure functional language and then an imperative sublanguage in the IO monad. And this is, a, this is kind of the same idea where we have, a, uh, we have a intuitionistic calculus and a linear calculus and they're both subsystems of this larger language. Uh, do we have one type system or two? Yes, we have, one, we, have two, we have one type system but two sorts of types. Yes, in the back. Uh, yes, this should be a turnstile. Does that make sense now? Okay. Yes, yeah, it should be, it should be a turnstile. Um, uh, sorry, did I, did I answer your question? 
about having one. It's, who, is, who is asking me about one language versus two? Yes. Yeah, so, so there are two languages. They sort of live on, uh, on th there are two sub-languages of one larger language, and they sort of are, the connection between the two is mediated by, the, by, the, uh, by these pair of type constructors, F and G. Uh -huh. In language, then, it's, then the top level expression will either be A or it will be A. Yeah. Yeah, both are possible. It depends on what your runtime system me needs, what, what type main should have. So in the, uh, uh, let me go here. So in, the, in this particular language that I implemented, it, uh, the, the definition of main, which was slightly arbitrary, said, give me a closed linear computation I can feed to the runtime to kick things off and build like a, build like a document. Mm -hmm. And so what, you, what we've got is this main function and then the runtime system will evaluate it and hook it up to the, uh, hook it up to the, to the, to the scene graph. But that, but that is sort of a sort of a, a a choice dictated by like you know here's the here's the runtime system that I'm that I've got and how how do I want to hook up to it? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. So in in this uh, in this setting, um, everything is total. So there's no difference between call by value and call by name. Um, and in general, in a linear system, it's basically impossible to tell the difference between call by value and call by name, because um, uh, let me see. Where did it just go? Uh, let me let me just point at this function type here. So the meaning of A lolly B means that A is a computation that is guaranteed to be used. And so you're, in fact, it's guaranteed to be used once. And so the difference between call by name and call by value is just when the argument is evaluated exactly once, um, but not whether it's evaluated at all. Yes. Uh, why would you want? Okay, so um, an example. So the so the reason you want to distinguish the two is because um, uh, so for instance in ML, ML has the ref type constructor for uh, for pointers, and um, the existence of of refer of pointers along with the ability to assign to them means that uh, lots of optimizations become unsound because you can't you can't uh, copy expressions in general, and you can't like do common sub-expression in general because you might you might change the number of times that you uh, that you perform an assignment, and so um, so you have like a you have a, a much more restricted equational theory. But when when things are when things are linear, then you know that every every action is going to happen exactly once, and so the full the full equational theory of the lambda calculus still holds, um, and so this so this uh, this lets you keep the full equational lambda uh, theory of the lambda calculus, but at the same time use an efficient efficient imperative data structures if you like. Um, <coughs> Or if you're, if you're not doing stateful programming, if you're doing concurrent programming, this will guarantee things like, you know, um, the two sides of a protocol will, you know, send once for each receive or something like that. So if you need to, if you need to, or guarantee that every file that's opened is closed exactly once. So it, it, lets, you, it lets you maintain protocol invariance in a nice way. Uh, any more questions? Yes. Uh, this morning when I talked about uh, the system is sort of like a syntactic way of guaranteeing some symmetric property. Yes. I'm curious if there's like a nice symmetric property that you get from linearity. Or like in other words, can you done your typing rules wrong? Yes. Can you design them so that you accidentally like duplicate something somewhere? Yeah. So there's a twist you could do that would break that would save you. 
Uh, yes, we'll, we'll actually see that in the next lecture. Um, so the, 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 let's see, how do, how do, I, how do I say this? So um, if, you, if you look at the categorical semantics of, of this particular calculus, um, you know, you can axiomatize it by saying, okay, the intuitionistic side should be a Cartesian closed category and the linear side should be a monoidal closed category and F and G should form an adjunction between these two categories. Um, and you can, what you can do is you can say, oh, I want to implement a state or, uh, or non-determinism this way. Then what you'll do is you'll check that the equations are all sided, that you want to, that all the typing rules satisfy all the equations that you want um, in, a, in a particular model. And what we'll do, what we'll do starting tomorrow is we'll look at a one particular model of, of uh, using linear types to model state. And then you'll, then you'll be able to see how you're, how you're able to validate these kinds of equations. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>